inviting us to the conference today. And um, so we put in a talk. Uh, it's called Virtual Routers, Soup to Nuts. And uh, we started telling our friends about this and what we were going to talk about. And uh, we didn't get the enthusiastic response that we expected. We got a lot of, huh? What? Oh, why do you want to talk about that? What? <laughs> and so what we realized is that, well, virtual routers, as cool as they were to us, are really a recent endpoint to a multi-year journey that's involved a lot of students and research there at the lab. So. But it all started one day with, uh, hey, Jeff, uh, we need a cyber range. And uh, it's got to be isolated. It's got to be able to simulate thousands of machines. And uh, yeah, it's got to have you know, realistic network relationships between all the machines. And uh, you know, they, didn't, they didn't mean this. They meant, of course, uh, computer and you know they they also needed it now and so I was a I was a new postdoc to the group I had not yet learned to fear the words government fiscal end of year um, I had you know roughly a week to well I had a day <laughs> to spec it and a week to make sure it was there um, and uh, it goes back to a project that well there was an oopsie that occurred that, you know, so that's why the isolated networks was, they were testing something, it got out. Uh, cyber ops didn't like the whole ORNL network being a test bed. So that's why, you know, we had to simulate thousands of machines and they wouldn't lend us theirs. And well, we couldn't make it too easy for it to spread around. So it needed some realistic relationships in between. So, uh, so I do work at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab in the Cyber and Information Security Research Group. And um, most, about half of us are mathematicians. The other half are computer scientists. Um, most of us do have PhDs. And we're not sitting around all day watching cyber threat analysis or anything like that. Um, this particular video was in, or Hyperion was a project featured here at the bottom. And I saved it up here just to uh, give you all an idea of you know, what do they do there? Um, and so Hyperion's a project, it takes binaries, don't, we don't need source code, and it takes any binaries and then converts them into their fundamental mathematical objects or their behaviors. And that's both hard math in terms of a lot of computing, a lot of very difficult, and it's also very hard to prove. But uh, anyway, that's a, a recent project of ours that has been licensed. And so we don't make products at the lab. So we license technologies. And so it's a, uh, it's, yeah, so it's a, a little different than, and, uh, you know, but working at the National Lab is, it's totally normal, right? And once you get your PhD, we no longer make you wear your sport coat into the server room. Had to get that one in there, Tommy. <laughs> and so, uh, and we share a building with the uh, Quantum Information Science Group. And ORNL is where I wanted to work. I was there as a graduate student back in the 90s. And, uh, and it's why I went back to graduate school to finish my PhD, was for the computers there. And it's a great environment for just walking down the hall and just knocking on somebody's door and saying, you know, I've got this wacky idea. And so uh, when we moved into this building, we, we inherited what was the original supercomputer room. And uh, so the, the original supercomputers that were now owned were in that room. I was, like I said, there in the early 90s, and uh, we returned to this building in mid-2012 after renovation. And in the meantime, there's a much, much, much larger supercomputer complex there covering acres of space. So this server room had become just a graveyard of junk. And uh, well, this is actually it today because we just got in 50 servers from uh, Titan. But 
it was much junkier than that. It was, it was a huge you know, pile of stuff, and we've, we're still pulling stuff out of that room. But I saw a great quote over at Pe Preservation Pub, uh, Thomas Edison, to invent, you need a good imagination and a good pile of junk. And so this uh, room provided that for us. So getting back to the story, so the computers were on order for the cyber range, and in the spirit of Oak Ridge, we started building before we knew what we were building. And uh, so, what's the cyber range? And a colleague had pointed me to one. He's like, oh, go talk to Cyprus. Yeah, so if you, this is a Google search from a few days ago. They're still number three on the list. Um, and he said, go talk to them. They're a cyber range. I was like, oh, okay, I'll go talk to them. Well, up here, I think it says, Da, 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 da. Realistic hands on cybersecurity training scenarios, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, cool, but where do I blow stuff up? I, I, I missed that part. And the Michigan Cyber Range is kind of the same. It says cybersecurity courses, exercises, services, and well, both of those are training. And I, so that's one of our T's, but then we've got the National Cybersecurity Range or cyber range at the bottom. Well, this one's from DARPA, scale model of the internet, which can be used to carry out cyber war games. Now, you know, they're the ones that got the testing. You know, he got where you can blow stuff up. So, uh, so we were kind of left with, okay, we've got these computers, they're here. We got to turn these things into a cyber range. And uh, so, well, the first one you kind of get for free isolated network if, you know, assuming I configure everything, so nothing, everything's internal to the cluster, then I just pull one cable and I've got that one. So that one's cool. That one was easy, okay. So the second one was thousands of virtual machines. And uh, um, yeah, so this is gonna go a couple of different directions. And the first one, this is called Megadroid. And this, is a colleague at Sandia National Lab out in California. And as it says up there, 300,000 androids clustered together to study network havoc. And uh, so they were they had booted hundreds of thousands of android virtual machines. Each of these had separate GPS. They had separate texting stacks. They had separate all this cool stuff. And so you could st study a whole city's worth of phones. And I'm gonna quote their publicity. Understand and limit the damage from network interruptions due to glitches in software or protocols, natural disasters, acts of terrorism, or other causes, end quote. But what we know they were really building was the world's greatest ingress blaster right there. <laughs> so, so, so um, Megatux, and MegaWin had preceded uh, Megadroid, and so they all used a QEMU, or anyway, KVM. Uh, Megatox had booted over a million Linux kernels on their cluster. MegaWin came along sometime later, I'm not sure when, booted 100,000 Windows XP and Windows 7. And I had been talking with them, and at some point they had gotten time on Titan, well, Jaguar, at the time, and they booted four and a half million Linux VMs on Jaguar. So anyway, so lots of virtual machines. Um, yeah, so scaling from what their specs were, they were using 520 nodes, 12 gigs of memory, core i7, I emphasize no disk, and uh, gigabit ethernet, roughly $500,000 is what they'd spent on it. And scaling to my cluster, I figured, yeah, I should be able to run 4,500 machines or so. A student did look at it last summer, um, the sources being open sourced, but it was still in the transition to open source. And kind of one of the unfortunate things of working at a lab is that you don't get paid to do things that aren't funded. And so, uh, you know, funding and coverage are big words that you uh, have to pay attention to. And uh, so it's, it's been a slow transition to open source. 
we have it, but it's it's not as available out there as I would have hoped. I checked again last night and just couldn't find it. Um, so the uh, the funny was that um, whenever I checked out these machines and they were shipping this way, it's like okay, I spec'd out. You know, I went and got Seagate drives or something and and had spec'd all that out. Well. And I had found drive caddies for these HP machines coming in. And, uh, well, it turns out that HP had purposely changed their design so that you could not get the drive caddies. And they charged an incredible amount for the drives. An incredible, like over $1,000 for an SSD type, incredible. So that's why none of my drives have covers. What I did is I went and printed with the 3D printer, the rails that they're all sitting on. So I saved over like $25,000 doing that. So anyway, <laughs> you know, it, that's, uh, yeah, so it was, it was nuts. HP was not very happy with me. But. Okay, so anyway, so now we've got thousands of virtual machines, at least theoretical, and all that was fine with me until another, hey, Jeff. Uh, we need 100 Windows VMs by Monday. And there's some bigwig coming in for a demo. We promised them everything. And well, we've tested it with four. <laughs> and it, it, it went way too fast to be really impressive. So we need a lot. And uh, well, I didn't have 100 Windows machines. And I didn't have any students at the time. So you know, it was going to be me doing it. And so. But I did have some friends, and pictured here are a couple of machines, and also an Oak Ridge tradition. These were called Fat Man and Little Boy. And these are two machines for um, National Institute of Health, Medicare, Medicaid, Fraud Detection Research. Um, the stack on the your left, OK, um, is a, a giant Hadoop cluster. 256 terabytes of storage sitting up here, hundreds of cores of uh, compute cores sitting down here in the bottom, and uh, it's running Zen server. And I, that used to be in our server room for a long time, right guys? A long time. We thought we'd never get rid of them. But yeah, you know, we had a great relationship with these sysadmins, so I went to their door and said, hey, I need 100 Windows machines, how can I do it? And so Cheetah was born. Um, I scraped together some USB drives, a few hard drives that I had laying around. I could boot a Windows machine in about a minute. And so success, I could run 100 Windows machines. And uh, so I was using Zen Server. It is open sourced, and um, students can support it. And so that's been an important thing here is just getting being able to keep it administered. Well, <laughs> okay. So uh, Cheetah today continues to run um, Zen Server. We, what has been a great feature of it is that the researchers don't have to conform their work to the machine. They can say, oh, you know, this software only runs on this version of Linux, and we're fine. Yeah, we can we can boot that. We do run a, window, a mixture of Windows and Linux. Um, it, uh, one, we're running a Hadoop cluster for Department of Transportation and malware research on it. Each machine now has 128 gigs of memory, five terabytes of storage per node. Um, some have computational GPUs. And what we were trying to do for a little while was to mimic the nodes on Titan, which is our supercomputer there, so we were trying to get it to where well, you would come to ours first and try it out and then go over, but that didn't play out terribly well. But still is uh, student supported for the most part. So at this point, um, we still definitely could do a thousand plus nodes if we needed. Um, we mainly maintain now VMs for researchers, and but we do keep it ready to repurpose for cyber range operations, and it's still a good student research um, test bed. And so we're uh, moving on to our last item on our checklist was realistic networks. 
And uh, so this is also going to break into two pieces. And so one's the physical network properties, and then the second being uh, network components. And so um, these next several slides um, come from Tommy Harden's CCI project with me last fall, and Tommy's up here and uh, in front. And what a CCI project is, is it's community college internship. It's what? Initiative. Initiative. Well, okay. <laughs> so, um, so it is, I, anybody's here, especially from Pellissippi or any of the small community college, these are really good chances for you to get in and uh, come to the lab. Our, our group by itself hosts 25 students a summer. Um, there's about 600 students that come to campus every summer. Um, but then there's um, both the SULI and CCI students. They're paid the same. They get to do the same work. And, uh, but the CCI is much less competitive. The SULI, um, I'm not even going to pretend and remember what it stands for, but that's the one that the, uh, the Harvards and the Yales and the, those other students come after. But the CCIs will often end up still with a few extra scholarships left. And so don't think that, well, I don't go to Harvard or Yale that I can't work and do some cool stuff. So anyway, getting back, problems with the cyber range. Well, they're all in the same box, or at least in our design, they're all in the same box. They're all in the same room. You know, so, you know, there's no great distance for network latencies. All the latencies are going to be the same. All the communications are going to be fast. And they're all going to be reliable. Well, real world networks don't have those traits. And so we had the question, you know, so how do you add these physical network properties to a stack of just servers? And so this involved walking down the hall and chatting with somebody and I was just, hey, have, have you ever heard of anything? And so I asked another colleague and he pointed us towards something called WANM, which is Wide Area Network Emulator. And so, so they, uh, um, this is where Tommy's project picked up was exploring WANM. And so it was to add the real world simulation of packet movement between networks with dropping packets, network latencies, bandwidth, bandwidth usage. Um, we had set up a small experiment, and so this is showing um, we had 25% packet loss is what we were aiming for, and a 200 millisecond latency. And so we have a column of 200s. And you laid it out hooking it up to a normal network switch, but then you were routing through the WANM box in order to, to pick up these traces or to pick up these uh, network features. And so with WANM, well, it was old. It was uh, um, NOPIX based, which I, anyway, I don't know a whole lot about NOPIX and it was old, but it was open source. It was mainly Bash and PHP. Um, the way we booted it, it was just a live boot image, and it was set up through a web page, so there was no scripting, you know, and we were trying to pick these features up, and what we really wanted was this module that we could take and plop into our chain somewhere in the uh, Zen server, and then we kind of hooked some machines behind it, and so then in order to get to those machines, then you you would pick up all these features like they were on the other side of the country. And so digging through the scripts, we found that it was all really ultimately an interface over a command called TC. And we're like, huh, <laughs> what's TC? So it turns out to be a good old base component built into Linux, or the Linux, at least the router <laughs> stack of Linux. And so it stands for traffic control, all the different uh, physical features that we were wanting are just you set arguments into TC and you know so overall we could declare you know this is good enough we could somehow kind of work around TC set up a very small Linux virtual machine inside of our Zen server and 
and um, wire it into Ethernet ports, have TC in between, and you know, so we could we could declare this one success. And then after uh, after we'd done all this work and dug through all this stuff and piled through all that junk, I went back to my colleague that I'd originally asked about Wanham, and he's like, and I said, "You ever heard of TC?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, of course, that's traffic traffic control." And he went on, and I was like. Well, you know, you could have saved us <laughs> a lot of work, but well, it was fun, right, Tommy? Okay. <laughs> so, so it's it, it could be a little messy, I, you know, but we kind of considered the messy and the homegrownness of this to be a, a little bit of its charm, and so we're we're getting down finally to our uh, maybe our what our subject was originally be the uh, the virtual routers. And so, you know, cyber ranges in any of these things, we do malware testing and um, things like that. But, you know, for those, you're really mainly focused on the machine realism. Can we hide that it's a virtual machine from the malware so the malware will do whatever it's supposed to do? And, you know, so rarely do you mess with the network. And, but it, kind of had the question in the back of my mind, you know, could we get to those components someday? You know, could we, could we get to those poor neglected machines that are, just, you know, millions of them sitting out there, the routers and the switches that carry all of our traffic, but we don't think about them. And, uh, and so anyway, you know, inside of the various virtual machine clusters that you work with, Zen Server, VMware, they have virtual switches. Turns out the uh, Zen Server uses something called Open vSwitch. It's really cool. I don't understand it. Uh, I get very, very, very confused um, with it. Uh, VMware has this virtual switch that's it's one that I'm much less confused by. And uh, so at least I could see, oh, this is hooked to the NIC. Okay, I understand that. You know, and if I hook a wire in here, it's going to go to these machines. Okay, I understand that. You don't get that luxury with the uh, Open V switch, at least not yet. And uh, Zen Server, it's and um, there is a VMware feature for like advanced VMware that we don't have. Virtual and it's called their virtual distributed switch, and that is a Cisco virtualized switch, I think, a V1000. Anybody here from Cisco that can verify that? Um, so I did have a student last summer trying to figure out Open vSwitch for me, and he was trying to create good networks and bad networks, but uh, we it didn't didn't go real far, and it was uh, still confusing. But overall, you know, there are wires or something. <laughs> Somehow these machines joined together. But it was still virtual, you know, and is Open vSwitch going to behave like a real router? Could it be misconfigured like a real router? Who in the world knew how to configure one of the stupid things and misconfigure it like a real piece of hardware could be? And uh, so we've wanted to do things like maybe VLAN attacks or how robust are the packets and, you know, what could you do? So, uh, so then Tommy came along one day and said, Hey, there's this really cool thing that I saw somewhere, school or someplace, and it's called GNS3. And um, so the, the website's gns3.net, and it is really cool. So as it says here, the software that empowers network professionals. And so we're going to be going into this quite a bit. And what I first saw in this was really a GUI, a way you know, you saw our stuff. It was pretty messy, pretty yucky um, back there. And, and so maybe this would be a way that we could collaborate with different researchers and build a network and uh, get them working on the uh, cyber range. But uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. And so we have a couple of videos here. And let me see. I think I need to click. All right. Awesome. And so what we're doing here is dragging out a couple of routers, and you see they're labeled up there. That's a C20 or a Cisco 2600. And uh, 
we're just going to build out a small network. And so it is open source. You can go download it. Um, there's binaries built for Windows, Mac, and Linux, or is Linux compiled? Okay, you have to compile it, but it does work very well after a little bit of work. And so now dragging out some switches. This won't go on too much. We'll, uh, we'll fast forward here in a second. And so now getting to wire it up. Wouldn't it be cool if this was like real life that you could wire it that quickly? You know, it'd be like that virtual, what was the, the this earlier talk today, it had the, uh, the Air Force guys and, you know, we need some virtual missiles and stuff to go get these cyber guys, you know? So man, it'd be really cool if you could just hook everything up and be done this way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think we're pretty close to the end, so I'm going to go ahead and um, jump to the next one. Um, and so it's it's been all hooked up. Oh, fully bugs. Yeah, that's par for the course. Okay, so let's see if we can get it to play. No, we don't want to play that one again. All right, are you going to play? Please? Yay. Okay. All right, and so what we're um, showing here, he'd gone ahead, and so Ben's been the one laying all this out. Um, and so we're actually going to wire chart some of the traffic on, on this uh, laid out grid. And so go to a machine. He started Wireshark on one of the links. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, they're very simple machines. Yeah, so anyway, I think that's the end of the video. But overall, you were Wireshark's built into GNS3. So here you are. You can do this really cool. I'm going to jump back. Ah, yeah, that one. No, don't play again. Anyway, uh, you know, that you've got it labeled, you've got it played with, you've got stuff and blinky lights and all kinds of cool things right there. It's great. And so um, let's see if we can go over. Please? Yay. All right. So GNS3, it was uh, originally created and is focused on the networking certifications, so the CCNA, that kind of stuff. There are training videos on itpro.tv, and uh, so both um, Ben and Tommy have watched that. And it's just a great test environment to tinker around with lots of equipment that you could never go out and actually own. And, you know, I, I like I said, I saw a GUI for this big mess, and so maybe we could do something like, well, you build it in GNS3, and then somehow we turn a crank, and poof, it, you know, it, it worked out on SIN server. It would already be tested, it would already, the researchers could go, oh yeah, that's what we want, and there it would be. So that's what we were hoping for. And, and uh, there was one other feature in here. And uh, this is where we get to virtual routers and uh, running real iOS. And so uh, hopefully it's another video here. Um, what are we going to do? I've already forgotten. So, OK. Oh, uh, is that a PC? I missed the. Uh, so we're on. So the to answer your, the PCs are really simple. They have basically ping and I don't know what else, but not very much. You know, not much above a DOS box, if that far. And uh, so he's pinging inside the left-hand network, so it's just going across the switch here. And so, yay, success. And now. going to try pinging the other side, and so picking up uh, one of the 172 addresses on the other side here. And yeah, who got that one? Yeah, so 
So now, no route, can't get across there. Destination host unreachable. Going up, and now here's where kind of the amazing stuff comes from, if you uh, know what you're seeing here. And so that was a show IP route command. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead. Two, 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 at some point. <laughs> Did it end? I, no, it doesn't end yet. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so doing standard Cisco commands, jumping into whatever mode that's called. Um, yeah, global config, adding the route. This isn't a simulation, so. No. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was stretching them out as much as I could. I'm sorry, but I'd be glad to play it. And so adding the route, I can read it to you. <laughs> I'm sure you would love to have me read you uh, Cisco commands. Um, and so anyway, um, but it's straight. They're, it's running iOS. And uh, so now to, oh, OK. I forgot what Ben was doing here. Yeah. And basically, I was the guy that did the. So. Uh, <laughs> and I basically, I just set up a static route between those two networks. Oh, there. okay. And now it's succeeded, right. right? Okay. And I guess you're going back to the machine, and we'll prove it out that now traffic's going to cross this link across the top, route between the two routers. So we can see how the story ends here. So, I'm going to be happy here. Da, 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 if you can remember the IP address, come on. Yeah, there is a Cisco something ASA. ASA yeah, ASA. there is a Cisco ASA. Okay. Yeah, so that's in there. So uh, I really like this lizard. He or, he or she, we'll say a she. Reminds me of Liz, the lizard in the Magic School Bus, so that's why it appeared a couple times. So that's where we're heading. So, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the the virtual computers in GNS3 are just lacking in any fidelity. They're not real machines. They're these I don't something DOS boxes basically. But the network components in GNS3 were just extraordinary in fidelity. I I didn't expect that we'd ever get there. And so now, could we kind of marry the two? Could we bring the VMs that we had over on Zen Server to the GNS3 virtual routers? And I think I've added, but anyway, GNS3 is open source and mostly Python. So, you know, in terms of a project, you know, this it doesn't get any better. So the project for, well, how did GNS3 do it? It's just Python. We've got to be able to figure this out. Well, it's a project. You, got Python, you get the GNS3 source, you get Eclipse, and you get a student. And you teach the student Python, and then you just wait until the student steps through, steps through, steps through in Eclipse until the student figure out where the magic happens, and then poof, you know, we have completed the project. And so, well, Ben here's the student, and so we had everything else, and we started, we got the source, and we started working on it, and then it was like within the first hour of just going through the source code, getting it lined up, trying to figure out how to do it, we came across this, uh, this package called Dynamips in there. I, was, I could account for everything else, and there was this Dynamips, and I'm like, hey guys, what's this Dynamips thing? And they're like, 
Oh, Dyna IPS. Yeah. Yeah, they talked about that in the IT Pro videos. And it was like, hmm, I, are you sure it's Dyna, Dyna IPS? And yeah, sure enough, he pronounces it that way. But I looked at it and I'm like, I bet this is a MIPS chip. And they were too young to know what a MIPS chip was. And, uh, and so that was, for those of you too young to know what a MIPS chip is, it was one of the early RIS chips in the uh, RIS sys time. And at one point when in my graduate school career that spanned 18 years, so there's a lot that was in my graduate school career, I got to meet the architect of the MIPS chip. He had come to visit the um, CS department at UT. So anyway, so we see MIPS in we start digging in and it's like, what's DynaMips? And so DynaMips, DynaGen, uh, DynaMips is an emulator. It was written um, uh, for the MIPS and later for the PowerPC uh, instruction sets. It has support that way then for the older Cisco routers up to a 7200. And so there are still some Cisco routers that you could still go by that it will emulate. Um, Supposedly, the newer routers are all based on custom CPUs and special sauce, which is my Cisco rep's favorite phrase. And um, there's some question as to, I put maybe in question mark, that there are people having success taking new Cisco routers and emulating in GNS3. Um, and it does not support Cisco Catalyst switches, which I'm just a mathematician. I looked at it. That one says Cisco, that one says Cisco. I didn't know there was a difference between Cisco switches and Cisco routers. And uh, turns out there's not that much difference between the two. They are running the same thing. And it's not, that's not as true as we originally thought. But there are special ASIC chips inside that handle the, the catalyst switches. But like all the front end stuff is, is standard chips that Dynamips can handle. Um, I put this in here just out of, these are the instruction lookup tables for the MIP64 <laughs> chips and the PowerPC32 um, chips there, and they're just big tables if you start dumping them. And these are the files that are spit out whenever a, a DynaMIPS router is running. This is like its temp folder. So let's go back. Let's try to figure out, well, what do we need to do in order to make all this work? And so in this video, we're going to go and um, actually import from scratch a, uh, a router. And so so this is back in GNS3. And oops. Let me move my cursor out of the way there. OK, so it's going. It's asking for the iOS image. I'm browsing to a folder. And choosing, this is a C2600 or a Cisco 2600 image. Um, it was asking there, do you want to decompress it? And so if you fire up, if you watch a Cisco router booting, one of the first things it'll say was decompressing the kernel. And so um, this is preemptively doing it, and so you don't have to decompress it each time you fire it up. Da, da, da. Um, this is um, you know, basically figuring out what are you going to call it? What is it? Well, it's a 2600, and, but the drop down chassis and platform, it does have a slew of different models. If they're like one of our other ones was a 1721, so out of the 1700 series. But this is an interesting one that you would never be able to do is that you can sit here and choose different hardware to go in the slots that would be on the physical router that if you had bought one. And so you could choose this crazy equipment. Some of the other ones that we did, we'd chosen like fiber cards and throw them into the slots. 
This one's a whatever. Oh, okay, so that's a 16 port Ethernet switch, right? Okay, so you could create a, a switch router type of thing. And so in this one, these are uh, serial cards. So if you were doing T1, T3, that kind of stuff, you could do it. Um, I guess you put one in there. Yeah, might as well. They're free. And uh, a different thing, I'm going to speed it off here. So was the idle PC factor, but that's just to get it to where it doesn't abuse your CPU, whatever you're emulating on quite as much. But overall, we got an image, whatever that is, and we set some stuff, and cool. So, uh, so what do we need to do it? Well, for virtualized routers, we needed a dot .bin, whatever that is, and we needed a config file. Well, my students wouldn't let me know where they got the dot .bins, and you all can ask where they came from later, from but they came from our Cisco routers. Any Cisco people here? Good. That's exactly where they came from. So this is off of one of our Cisco routers. That if you do a dir of the flash folder on every Cisco router ever, here is a file called something 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 dot bin. That's the same file. So you go get a Cisco router. There will be a dot bin there. You do show running config. Good. All right. I'm new to the Cisco stuff. Um, you'll get the other config file. So got a dot bin, I've got a config. And so now my question became, well, if if I can do this, can I can I, you know, have an iOS bin file, a config file, and you know, can I can I deploy this into my my cyber range? And so this is my very poor drawing of what I was thinking, I was like, you know, run a Dynamips router iOS thingy up there, have lots of ports, and we'll connect to it, and wow, this will be great. And so, um, you know, ask the question, and well, my solution was, well, GNS3 does it. GNS3 just needs Python. I can make a really thin Linux wrapper, put Python in it, fire up GNS3, fire up a router, you know, have some ports somehow or other down there, and so that's, that was my solution. Um, thankfully, uh, Ben found a much more elegant solution, and so it's going to come up and tell you about that now. Okay, how do I press next on this here? Okay, right here? All right. Okay, so um, to make this kind of quick, um, I really was inspired uh, for the connection to be made through this guy here. So whoever you are, thank you. Um, it was, uh, I was really just looking at virtualized routers. Um, you know, did a Google on it and everything, and I came across this, and all of a sudden, I started reading through this, and I said, wow, Dynamips and Dynagen. That's what he's talking about. He's, not, he's just dispensed with GNS3 and gone back in time to Dynamips and Dynagen. So, all right. And then here, and just to get this to play, I just click it, right? All right. So, okay. VirtualBox VM, all right, firing it up here, logging in here, and, uh, and so I'm going to go sh basically show how we could go back in time, right, to move forward, um, and take a look at Dynamips. Now, we're setting up, this is what they tell you to do, set up these directories here, all right, and you've got your configs, images, and working directory, and we're going to look basically at the configs and the images. That's really, for details purposes right now, that's the most important. So I'm going to go into the configs file. And we're going to look right here at what's called uh, 2600.net, which belongs to Dynagen, right? Dynagen uses a text file, right? It parses these text files, right, this text file, to set up the VM, the router VM, right, and gets it running. So we've got the RAM, we've got our, you know, disk, we've got notice that we've got the location of the bin, and we've got um, a Telnet port, and we had some other ports that they've set up there. So a way to map that. Uh, to the actual VM. So you're mapping interfaces to the VM interfaces. All right. So now we're going to look at this. Takes a basic, a you know, a startup config. That 2600.initial.configs.txt is your basic startup config for a Cisco router. All right. So and that's basically there. It's 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 going to be loaded onto our VM router or you know our virtualized router. 
Um, and we did have a little bit of some addresses already put in there, so. All right. And the next step here um, is we're actually going to take a look at our images. We've got another little file over here, a directory for um, where we keep our Cisco images. We have a .bin and a .image. .image was, has been decompressed. Um, it usually helps. That's helpful for the CPU to actually already have it um, you know, decompressed there. So now we're going to run what's called the Dynam Dynamips command for the Dynamips software in hypervisor mode, by, uh, you know, dash H. It's going to listen at port 7200, um, I guess, on uh, the VM's, I guess, TCP ports. It's running out. And then we're going to run Dynagen to actually configure the specific VM instance. OK. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, this is actually my laptop here. But it could be run, yeah, we'll hopefully to get it over to, <laughs> to, the, you know, to, to Zen server or some other virtual environment. All right, so now we've entered the Dynagen. Um, run that command, so now it's basically up and running, right? And the way that you get to it, well, I'm gonna show you a little bit here about Dynagen. Um, basically, Dynagen was written as a text front end, text-based front end uh, for Dynamips. And, um, and so you got a bunch of these little commands that you can run um, to interact with the VM. And you can also set up several instances of VMs. You can set up three or four different routers and interact with them through this text console. But the best way to do it is to Telnet. Um, to tell them that straight into uh, your virtualized router. So, and so I'm here, I'm putting the little telnet thing here, telnet command. Um, that's the actual, um, <laughs> that's the IP address of the, uh, the VM. And there's telnet port 2000, 2001, I guess. And there we are. There we're in, executive, in exec mode on the uh, Cisco router. I did a show running config here. Don't worry when it complains about the RAM. Um, there's little things you can fiddle with, it's like you know, fixing the amount of memory. Um, so we did a show running config. It's building the configuration. It looks like uh, you know, basically you've got console to a Cisco router, and there are our see our, our addresses that we've configured on the interfaces, just like we had in the in the startup config file. And then finally, we're going to do a little show interfaces here and show you that just looks like when you run a show interfaces command there, um, that's the information that's being pulled up. And then here I thought I was going to do a show in interfaces brief, but this version, of, I guess this version of iOS didn't have that, so I was like, what is it? Where is it? So I ran a little question command here and uh, show interfaces summary. So um, that's really where we're at uh, right there. So that's just sort of a little example of how it runs and looks and feels. Uh, like a Cisco router there, so. Thanks, Ben. And so, we'll coming up to the end, and so where could this take us? Um, and so, we were feeling pretty proud of ourselves. We had really dug through a lot of cool stuff, and uh, a couple weeks ago, a coworker in our group, who we've never met, in four years, um, came, he's coming back to the lab. And so he spent the last four years as program director for the NSF um, computer and network systems um, program. And so he came back to give us a talk about you know, what he's been seeing, what he's been working on, what the proposals are there. And so one of them was this uh, NSF cloud, so it's National Science Foundation. and. He had this slide that I, um, I took a picture of. And so on the left here, it shows one of the original ARPANET um, routers. Had one core, a whopping 1.1 megahertz clock, 64K of RAM, and no disk. The disks were too expensive back then. And um, it cost two and a half million dollars, well, in today's money, so uh, $650,000 then. And on the right is something he's calling the Genie Project, or and it's uh, the rack has whatever each U high had 32 cores, 2.1 gigahertz, 16 gigs of memory. Yeah, 16 gigs of memory, four terabytes disk space. I guess cost two hundred thousand dollars for a full rack. And what you're running on here are virtualized routers by the thousands and so so what well what this is enabling is as he said genie is deeply programmable 
um, it's sliceable and it can cut across all these different resources that the NSF has funded over the years. And so, you know, great. So you have something federated distributed high performance computing is the uh, fancy words he used. But now as you think about it, what research grants used to be, well, I've got this big problem. Well, I need a really big machine to solve the big problem. And so the research grants were often about how do I get this big machine? What am I gonna do with it after it's over with? But with, um, with these virtualized routers, well, we can slice you off a chunk of a machine across all the resources spanning the whole country and give it to you. And so it's, I coined the term writing up the slides, personal supercomputing. You know, it's allocated kind of on the fly as long as you need. And so now it has the potential to free up all that research and that you can slice it out, get it. Well, that's cool for the scientists, but what about the rest of us? Well, it's all this, the GNS3 community is one, now has millions of people. Um, they're pulling in Juniper routers, Juniper's participating, Cisco, the Cisco labs, Juniper labs, um, some different things that Ben's found. I still don't understand software defined networking. Well, there's a $50 class that you could sit there with real things and do real stuff instead of going and buying a Nexus 10K, whatever it is, trying to understand this. Training, certification still, but it's, it's become a great tinkering environment. And so playing around to understand the new, new threats, there's puppet scenarios you can trace out, what's puppet do? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't wanna slight Cisco in any way. Um, they have turned a blind eye to using their dot bins. Um, they, the Cisco rep was in my office a couple days ago and he was like, well, all that's fine, but we have this product and it's called the VIRL Viral, Viral something lab, personal edition, it's $200. What it adds that GNS3 and Dynamips don't get you is all the new stuff. And so it's got all the new routers and switches. There is a CML corporate network lab thing. It's about $10,000 um, and corporations are using it so that they can model their network before they try stuff out. So that's what they're doing with it. Like I said, the VMware distributed switch is a Cisco V1000 and Cisco is also participating in that Genie uh, NSF project. But overall, I just wanted to leave with the, you know, GNS3 is a great community. Um, Cisco's um, been good too, but really like to see them, you know, contribute those missing machines that eventually the, the Dynamips is just gonna die out from, uh, it just can't simulate the chips anymore, or emulate, sorry, not simulate. So overall, uh, cyber ranges, virtual labs, important for the big three T's, the teaching, which I, uh, the testing, so the cyber range type things that I was thinking of, and now I think it's important for the tinkering. I uh, wanted to put a shout out, I'm in the, one of the two organizers for DC 865 local group, and so we get together twice a month and tinker um, with the computer stuff, and Knox Makers, um, they are, they've been the soldering people over there, they're on the second floor. You aren't going to see them <laughs> unless you go upstairs in the scruffy city hall, and I don't know if they've left yet. But anyway, they're here. Great groups, and uh, we get together and play around and tinker and sometimes blow stuff up. So that's what we have. Thank you.